This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I know. This podcast has gone off in all kinds of crazy directions, away from my original trend-following focus. Now, of course, I do have trend-following guests on, and that's exactly what I'm doing today. But I like to be diverse. And as you know, if you listen, many of my guests that are not trend-following traders actually have the exact same mindset as a trend-following trader. They have the same strategy often employed in an entirely different discipline. That's just damn cool. Coming from down under, my guest today, a repeat performance, a repeat appearance, Nick Raj, a trend-following trader from Australia. Nick has a very mild-mannered approach, but a very confident approach, a very likable approach. No nonsense. If you don't like that kind of stuff, You won't like me. You won't like Nick. You need to go find some happy talk somewhere where someone promises you easy riches by just showing up with your absolute lack of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I sound a little wound up today. Deal with it. That's my life. That's what happens. You get wound up when you do a podcast and you talk to all these smart people. Without any further delay, let me jump into my friend Nick Raj and his Australian trend-following perspective. Are you doing any of these podcasts at all? It seems like everyone is these days. No. Oh, gosh, years ago, we had a business mentor. We paid this guy a ridiculous amount of money to help us out with the business in hindsight, idiot. But one of the things that he suggested we do was a podcast. I started doing a daily podcast, but it was just too much. And the upload time and, again, the tire kickers that, that just get attracted to it, it's just... Nothing bothers me more than tire kickers, Michael. (laughs) Well, it's actually going to be part of my discussion today, but there's some good tire kickers and there's some bad tire kickers. But to your podcast point, what's really interesting about it, if I look at my my change kind of early on talking to only traders, and now it's morphed to where I don't have to do so much. I can reach out to people that I want to interview like you. But what's really nice now is I, I have a lot of publishers that have just like, a-list smart people doing their niche and they reach out and they say, hey, do you want to talk to this person? So it, that makes it very easy. But I think if, if one's launching from scratch and it, it's it's a little bit tougher because you're right, just producing content is is a lot of work. It's a lot of brain power. I think it's a pretty saturated thing now, the podcasts. We go to Santa Barbara every year for an entrepreneurial conference and it has nothing to do with trading. One of the reasons why we go is to just try and keep ahead of the curve on this kind of stuff and see what new trends are coming out. Like one of the guys that I know years ago, we asked him, why do you keep going to these conferences? And he says, well, years ago, I realized that YouTube was going to be the tool for the next five, seven, ten years. And he became big on YouTube before it was a thing. And then He has a podcast, which he was big in before it became a big thing. It's interesting. I think you've got to stay in front of the curve. But I think for new people, you're quite right. It's it's a pretty saturated market. A lot of people kind of tipping out the same old, same old. You've got to do things differently. You clearly are. I mean, you, as you said, it's not purely just trend following anymore. You're speaking to some pretty interesting kind of people. I did a podcast interview a, a few weeks ago with Aaron Fifield, you know, chat with traders. And we did something totally different. And he actually said to me, interesting you brought this up because he said the same thing. He said, it's getting a bit stale just interviewing people for the sake of interviewing them. So we did something completely different for that exact reason. I think you're right. It's got to be somebody who's bringing a really unique 
piece of content, which before I was doing the podcast, obviously I, I like to think I am too, and I know you are. For the average person out there that's sitting around thinking, oh, I'm going to launch a podcast. The reality is, is you probably can't talk. You probably have no clue about how to interview somebody. You probably are not very interesting. So yeah, you can start a blog and you can start a podcast, but if you really, really don't do a lot of work and you don't look at somebody like a Joe Rogan and say, my gosh, that's who I'm competing with, it's tough sledding. It is what it is. And how's life in uh, Saigon? No complaints. I was kind of in your neck of the woods in the last week. I told you, I, I looked at the plane map. Obviously, we were starting in the northern part of Australia and then going down to the southeast to cross over to Auckland. I'd not even thought about the flight path before I did it. So you're actually not over water that much. You think New Zealand's way out in the middle of nowhere. Well, if you take that flight path, you're not really, you're not too far away from land, really. No, that's right. We call it the ditch. The The distance between Australia and New Zealand, they call the ditch. So you live on one side of the ditch or the other. <laughs> I've still not been to Australia. I'm going to have to figure that one out here soon enough. But the countryside, and I'm sure this is the same with Australia, just absolutely gorgeous. I I love the one small city I was in called Gisborne. Auckland, okay, I nothing against my friends who are in Auckland, but I'm going to take most Asian cities because they're just weird and quirky over Auckland, which is just kind of reminding me of the States with a funky accent and maybe a little London thrown in. I agree. I mean, Auckland, especially the city center, is, is certainly nothing special. You go 15 minutes outside of Auckland City and it's beautiful. I mean, New Zealand, it's just spectacular. And look, you just saw a tiny bit of the South Island is magnificent. We piled the kids into a camper van. God, I don't know how many years ago, 15 years ago, we piled the kids into a camper van and spent two weeks going around that North Island. And it's just fantastic. It's just, it's very different to Australia. There's certainly parts of Australia, small parts of Australia, especially Tasmania, that are very similar to New Zealand, but the rest of Australia is very, very different actually. But yeah, New Zealand's a pretty special place. Yeah, you know, I, I was visiting this one guy and he was in Gisborne and he set me up in this house to kind of rent for the for the little while I was there. And you know, you, you kind of go up this hill and the next thing you know, you're like, oh wow, that's the ocean. Oh wow, the mountains in the back, there's sheep everywhere. For a city guy, look, I've been around plenty of farm animals in my life. You know, we raised them when I was a kid, but. I got to say that that view just really smacks you as a city guy. You start to think, okay, can I get can I get all the conveniences here? Maybe I could live here. This is really nice. So there's my comeback for my New Zealanders, my Kiwis that are listening. They're thinking that I was ripping on Auckland. I got to tell you, Gisborne's amazing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what you should do next time you're down in this part of the world. Go down to Queenstown. It's just spectacular. Absolutely magnificent. A friend of mine bought a house there back in the early 90s and we thought he was absolutely nuts and then we realized they were building an international airport there and you've got a lot of ski resorts around that area and it's just stunning a big lake up in the mountains magic absolutely magic i should probably detour you from your anthony bourdain travel episode into a little bit of stuff today and I, you know i was thinking it's funny that you mentioned the other guy uh, talking about doing something different i guess i was thinking along the same lines today, but kind of as a refresher type course to like really get into the nitty gritty because I get these emails from folks and I have, a, I have an email series that goes out and it says to people, what's your biggest challenge? And I'm curious your immediate reaction when you hear these, these are probably the top three biggest challenges I hear. When to enter, I need consistency and I'm afraid to take losses. I think about those answers and I want your feedback, but I think about those answers and I think to myself, they're not doing anything. They're, they're not, they're, these really aren't their concerns. They just want to communicate with somebody. This is their way to just communicate because, I mean, someone says that they don't have consistency. My first question is, well, do you have a strategy even? Yeah. Well, that's the same kind of question you could ask with entries, right? I mean, they're looking for an entry. This is the same kind of question, I guess. Do you have a strategy? Because that's a part of the strategy. When you hear the word consistency, what's your first thought? Just kind of word association. You hear somebody wants to come to you, Nick, consistency. I'm so worried about consistency. In the retail space, that immediately suggests to me, they probably want to make money every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year without fail. That's what it says to me. If that's what they think professional traders do, well, they're going to be disappointed for a long, long time. Consistency for me as a professional trader is pushing the button 
every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year for 10 years, which I've been doing for, you know, 34 years now. And that's what consistency is for me. I, I come across people who are able to do it for two or three months, then they just forget it for whatever reason. And it's not necessarily they're losing money, but their heart's not really in it. They don't really get it. You know, they're not really understanding this is a long-term game. The only way you can have returns like Dunn and Abraham and these guys is because they push the button every day, every week, every month, every year for decades. And that's the only way to do it. But when I hear retail talk about consistency, I think they're talking about wanting to make money every day, every week, every month, every year. Yeah, well, you're talking about there's two forms of consistency there. You're talking about the consistency of waking up to Nick's plan every day, executing it. Okay, you're consistent to that. They're talking about, I want consistency. I want to imagine there's a tooth fairy that puts a trading nickel under my pillow every hour, every day. <laughs> right? Something like that. Sure. I don't even know where it comes from. Like, I think people are generally smart, but I, I, I just don't know where it comes from the idea that you're sitting at your house, you don't know anything about trading, or investing or whatever, and you say to yourself, okay, I need to make money every day. I need to make money every week or so. Where this even comes from? It doesn't work anywhere else in the world for anything. I see a lot of that as well. I recently had a phone call from a guy that rung me and he says, I want to trade for a living. I said, okay, well, how much trading experience do you have? He said, none. I said, right, do you play golf? And he kind of had to think about that for a second. He said, well, yeah, but what's your point? And I said, well, do you think you can be on the PGA Tour competing against Tiger and all the boys by the end of the year? And he goes, don't be an idiot. You know, of course not. And I said, well, you play golf, but you acknowledge that you can't play for a living and be on the PGA Tour by the end of the year. But on the other hand, you've never traded before, but for some unknown reason, you think you'll be able to make a living out of it by the end of the year. It just doesn't compute. And you're quite right, I think. And I don't know where that comes from. I don't know. I guess it's this... People think it's easy. The Wizard of Oz? Does it come from the Wizard of Oz or something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not, not this Wizard of Oz, that's for sure. No, I don't know where it comes from. But I, I just think it's – people are probably – I won't say ignorant. That's the wrong word, but misinformed or – There's your holy grails for you. There's plenty of people out there that are telling people they can do this. They can fulfill the exact dream and fantasy that they have. And here, I will show you how to do it, of course – it doesn't work that way. But it's also in every industry. You know, Australia's going through this mega property boom at the moment, and you get all those spruikers out there saying the same thing. And you've got this Amazon drop shipping going on, and it occurs everywhere. And of course, everyone's willing to sell that knowledge for a, for a hefty price. So trading's no different. Investing's no different. I think it just comes across our pathway a lot more than, than the other ones do, obviously. So, you know, I could this next question, I could sit around and give my personal spiel about it. But uh, it's more interesting to get your view on it. Somebody, let's pretend a beginner, because a lot of people, even though they're experienced in whatever their field is, they're still beginners when it comes to this. And I still think it's a really fascinating concept that most people really don't wrap their arms around truly, which is the, the notion of, of price action trading. You mentioned Dunn Capital. Why don't you put your best professor hat on and start at the elevator ground level with granny. I mean, how in the world does uh, price trading take place? What is price trading to a Nick Raj? Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, it's hard stuff today, right? Yeah, I mean, I just did a talk at the Australian Investors Association annual conference just a few days ago. Well, I asked the question, what the heck am I doing here? I'm the only guy who looks at price the rest of of the speakers, you know, the other 25 speakers and 700 delegates, they're all staunch fundamentalists. They use narratives. They use these homespun motherhood statements that we hear from the Buffett investors and that kind of stuff. You can't time the market. Diversification is the only thing that we have. You've got to have a 60-40 portfolio, all those kind of motherhood statements that we all hear. And I don't know. I think people just latch on to that and say, well, you've got to know what you're doing. I mean, I stood up and was frowned upon because, you know, I showed them a trend following strategy for Australian stocks and made the comment that I actually had no idea what half of these companies did. It gets a giggle out of the crowd, but they probably walk out shaking their head and go, that guy's an idiot. 
Do you think they really listen enough to know what you mean when you flippantly say you don't know what these com- some of these companies even are? Do, they, do you think they immediately think, well, this guy's just not that bright? Or do you think some of them even get what your real point is? People do definitely get what my point is, but I would suggest that like you, I've spent my whole career hammering home this trend following thing. You do get that message through to people. It's like the light bulb moment. You know, I get people come to me and say, gosh, I just followed this big trend. It's been going for nine months and I've made so much money and I've done nothing. I've sat on my hands for nine months and made all this money. What was I thinking doing all that day trading crap or, you know, that other stuff that I was doing? And once they get it, they really truly understand. But I think it's like a normal learning process. It's very difficult to tell someone what to do. They've got to get it themselves. They've got to get that light bulb moment. It's kind of like sitting on your psychologist's couch. You do all the talking. And the reason why you do all the talking is because that's the only way you're going to get it. You'll come to that realization, whatever it may be, by nutting it out yourself. So in this particular audience, there certainly were people that get it and understand and understand that I wasn't being flippant. I wasn't being smart ass. I generally do not understand what a lot of these companies that I trade actually do. And I don't really care because at the end of the day, when I put my tax return in, the tax office, all they're after is the price I've bought and the price I've sold. They don't care about the valuation I've put on the company or the earnings per share. They don't care. They don't ask those questions. All they want to know is where you buy, where you sell, and that's what it comes down to. You also have the potential for an audience like that of experienced fundamental types that when you present as you're presenting – And they've all got careers and they've got time invested in something. That's how they make their money. That's how they make their living. Even if it's suboptimal, even if it's frankly not workable. So a guy like you walks into the room, it's kind of like uh, instant cognitive dissonance, like instantly like, you know, what, what does someone do when they've made the wrong bet? Now, the smart person that makes the wrong bet gets the heck out, but that's easier said than done, huh? Absolutely. In fact, there was a speaker there who is kind of known as Australia's Warren Buffett. And there's a big story behind that. We won't go into that. But this particular person, I understand, was kicked out of his own own funds management business. Storch fundamentalist. He bought into a company. Share price kept going down and down and down. He kept buying more and more and more. And I believe eventually there was 50% of the fund's money into this one position and it kept going down. He was forced out and it did end up in all sorts of excuses. The company misled us. We weren't given the right information, so on and so forth. But that's just an excuse. At the end of the day, you're going to plunge 50% of your fund's money into a single position that goes pear-shaped. Well, the outcome is not going to be good. And we've seen it with some of the big guys around town, you know, the Herbalife debacle. And admittedly, that wasn't 50% of the fund, but still big psychological losses for getting it wrong. And being in such a conviction of a position is just the wrong thing to do. I have no conviction to any position. I don't, I don't just don't care. It's, it's like, water off a duck's back. Okay, move on. Next thousand trades. That's what I say. Next thousand trades. It's just a game. You're like a big kid playing a video game. Really? You know, what are the rules? How do you have to play to stay alive? How do I have to put myself in a position to profit when something happens that I can't predict? And there you go. It's a game of mathematical expectancy. That's all it is. Everyone plays the same game. doesn't matter if you're Warren Buffett. doesn't matter if you're a staunch fundamentalist value investor. At the end of the day, It's how much you win when you win and how much you lose when you lose. And the only thing you can control is how much you lose. You can put any valuation on any stock you want. You can say gold's going to go to 10,000. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day how you want to do it. The only thing you can control is how much you're willing to lose. Believe me, like we saw in the GFC or 2008, it only takes a bit of a knock in a few positions to really do the damage to someone's portfolio. Not only their portfolio, their long-term wealth, and more so their psychological perspective. You know, a lot of people lost so much money in 2008 that they could not step back into the market in 2009, and they missed a fantastic opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong. 
Personally, I lost 13% in 2008, but psychologically and even financially for that matter, I was still in a position to be able to step into the market in, in 2009 and from memory, I think I made 28% return that year. That's the difference right there, being able to say, well, okay, I made a loss that year, but it's not going to take me out of the game. It's not going to take me out psychologically, so I can keep playing. As you say, it's like a video game. When I think of the states and I think about the acceptance of trend trading, trend following, price action trading, I don't know what the acceptance is. I, I don't know what the, the understanding is. I, I would still say it's really small, r- relatively speaking. Now, I do find that in the last six, seven, eight years, hustling around Asia here and there and popping in to speak with a certain audiences, I do find, and especially in China, that Asian audiences really accept the idea of price action trading very quickly. And they seem to have a built-in understanding that the fundamental stories are all bullshit. They seem to kind of like, (laughs) they don't trust any of it. They seem to adopt this trend-following mindset quicker than the states. Now, I'm curious, given your home country, how would you describe the Australian acceptance to your way? Are you really, you mentioned the 25 guys and you're the one lone standout there. Is it similar to the States, do you think? Or do you think Australia has got a a leg up on acceptance of your style? I would say we're probably worse than the States. It means like Hong Kong. Every time I go to Hong Kong, it's a bunch of white guys that look at me (laughs) incredulously like, no, this doesn't work. (laughs) I would say we're much more aligned with that. I'm sure there would be a small segment of fund managers here in Australia who would use some kind of trend following slash momentum style approach, but I'd be struggling to name more than two or three or four. You'd have a few more than that in the US. Admittedly, the US is a significantly more larger market, more sophisticated market and probably more open, but yeah, no way. Even in retail circles, as I said, this conference I was at, I don't know, there was five, 600 delegates. I can't say I packed the room out, Michael. Like There were people in the room, but it wasn't like it was overflowing. What keeps you going to spread the message? I mean, I know you do, you do well with your life and your business and everything, but what keeps you going when sometimes the acceptance is not as strong as you'd like? I don't really care. I'm not going to stand up on a chair and say, you people are missing out here. This is the best thing since sliced bread. I can put my message out there. And I take this from Dunn from back in the days, Bill Dunn, back in the day. I tell you what I learned from him is that he said, we just try and attract like-minded people. We're not trying to be everything to everybody. We just attract like-minded people. And that's what I get with my trend following stuff. If you don't like what I do, that's fine. It's not going to impact my life. It might change your life, but it's not going to impact mine because I'm not going to stop doing something that I've done reasonably well for 30 odd years. If people don't take the time to appreciate that, then I struggle to take the time to really try and help them out with it. You just try and attract like-minded people. They'll help you, you will help them and you get along. But um, I asked to do the talk. I do my talk. If people are interested, great. I'm happy to help out as much as I can. If they shrug their shoulders and go, that guy's nuts. Well, hey, fine. No problems. This happens though. The nuts thing happens to people that have strong opinions. People that have opinions, frankly, any opinion often can cause the uh, mob to have an aneurysm and, and lose their mind. Take me back in time though. I know we talked about this before, probably in an earlier episode, but take me back to for the new audience now, take me back to a start time. Like what was the trigger for you where you had that light bulb go off, the eye-opening moment where you're like, oh, wow. Because I don't know, did you start with a fundamental take? I mean, nope. no, you didn't. You well, get, Explain it to me. How do you come at this? I remember exactly. Absolutely crystal clear like daylight. I can remember November 1985, thereabouts, give or take a month, I was a junior, I was 18 years of age, I had just left school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, in fact, here it is, this is what I wanted to do, you'll hear it here first, and you can confirm with my wife Trish, she'll tell you the same thing, 
Nick wanted to catch a train, work in an office building, and carry a briefcase. That was my goal after I left school. I thought that was the, the bee's knees of success. Listen, after grad school, I was prepared to go do that in, in Manhattan as well. I was fully prepared to do that. I didn't care what I did. So long as I caught a train, worked in a building, carried a suitcase, everything else was <laughs> insignificant. But here's what happened. The brother-in-law of a girl I was seeing back in those early days, he worked for a big stockbroking firm, a very blue ribbon stockbroking firm. He was actually the accountant and he needed someone to help push paper around. So I said, you don't know what you want to do. Why don't you come and do this? So I did. And started pushing paper around and we were all on one floor in this particular stockbroking firm. And just up the way was the private client desk. And I wandered on up there one day and there was all the private client advisors and one guy had some chart paper and he was plotting a moving average crossover strategy with pen and paper on our Australian index futures. So the same as your E-mini S&P 500 futures. That's what he was plotting and that's what he was trading. I took one look at that chart. I said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, well, when the red line crosses the blue, you buy. And when the red crosses back down, you sell. And I could see the trends. I could see, oh, yeah, I can see that. By that afternoon, I had gone down to the local stationery store, bought some chart paper, red pen, black pen, blue pen, from that day forward, I started plotting moving average crossovers, exactly what that guy was doing. It was trends right there. It was trends. That's what it is, right? Trends. What was the next step though? I mean, you, you have this wake up call, very different than the way I was woken up, but we got to the same place in a way. But what happened next? What was the building upon that? Just going out and trading and making some money? I mean, or was there another influence that came along? What happened next is that I went into the office manager, said to him, I'd like to trade futures. And he was a wily old guy. And he's taken a look at this 18 year old fool. And he said, well, if you want to trade futures, you need to have me sign off on it, the ticket, you write the ticket, and then I will ring it down to the trading floor. Now, if we go back to 1985, I was earning about $12,000 a year, maybe $10,000 a year. The share price index futures back then was $100 a tick. I was playing with dynamite and I had no idea. Now, bear in mind, all I had, Michael, was a five and 10 day moving average crossover. That is the extent of my trading strategy. No position sizing, no risk management, no nothing. I had to write a ticket, wait to get into the office manager's office so he can sign off. So I couldn't even place a stop couldn't do anything. It was just crazy stuff. Needless to say, that went on for a little while. And I really can't remember a great deal about where that went from a profitability standpoint. Because in the heady days prior to 1987, I got pulled into other stuff that I thought was significantly more profitable, which in the end was what blew me up in 1987. Well, you were not alone in that. And that ultimately becomes without too much going behind the curtain, so to speak, but you just say you blow up in 1987. Obviously, that was a foundational, pivotal moment for you to have that happen. I'll tell you what, if I had stuck with that moving average crossover system, I actually would have been short into 1987. That's the irony of it all. That's the irony. But as you say, I was young, I was stupid, had no idea what I was doing, jumping from place to place, pot to pot. But Admittedly, I vowed to never make that mistake again, and touch wood, I never have. And I guess the big move back into trend following was a few years later, I came across a talk. It was just a random talk by a <laughs> believe it or not. Who recently passed away. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Wow. Oh. That wasn't my aha moment when I saw him. It was, if you like, a reintroduction to trend following. And more important, it was my first exposure to volatility adjusted position sizing. Up until then, I knew nothing about that kind of stuff. To hear him talk about that was like, wow, yeah, I get it. That's a big part of the equation that I had not even considered and never even 
you know, thought about it. But yeah, that's what I remember. What I find interesting, some of the things you just said, in particular one thing, is you describe yourself as stupid. Now, you're not saying this for the eternity of your life. You're only saying this is a moment in time. But I think it's really rare that people, and this is kind of a sidebar tangent, I think it's really rare that people are willing to say, I was stupid. I, I don't hear that very often. I'm curious what the audience would think, but I just think it's a rare bit of self-reflection where, where you're willing to say, I was dumb there. I was stupid there. I made a big error there. I think so many people are just looking to save face and keep the illusion going on. There's power in saying I was stupid because it's it's very it's very zen in a way. It's kind of like acknowledgement, let go, move on. But I think a lot of people would maybe go the opposite of what you said. They would never admit they were stupid and they keep trying to rationalize something and and hang on to something. And this gets into the psychology part of it, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, sure. And look, I'm on the wrong side of 50 now and I can reflect back and think of all the things I've done and some things I'm not proud of. And you can't change it though. All you can do is keep moving forward. But, you know, I took that lesson in 1987 it's learned from it. And that's the most important thing. If you have winning trades, then you have lessons you learn, if you like. If you continue to take those lessons and heed them into experience and, and move forward, then they're good things to have. You know, you've got to learn to lose money before you can learn to make money, in my view. And I certainly did that. And I understand what went wrong and how it went wrong. And there was a lot of bad things going on there with regard to leverage and stupidity and no position sizing. And I don't have enough time in this podcast to talk through all of them. But as you know, it was like a tsunami of all these things coming together. Something else that's interesting about what you're describing. You're a young guy. You get randomly exposed to a strategy and you immediately see some viability in it. You immediately believe in it. You don't think to yourself, you know, I've got a certain type of personality, so I can't really accept this strategy. I must go analyze my personality and then come back to find out if this strategy fits with me. Now, my sarcasm comes from something that I posted recently or something that I saw and that I posted and try to get a little debate going. But you know, there's a, quite a few people, people that I respect in the trading world that say you must fit your personality to your trading style. If you start to break the language down, you say, okay, you must fit your personality. I once administered the Myers-Briggs instrument. It doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. So if you're supposed to fit your personality to the trading style, well, the first issue is what the heck is the personality and how is it measured? And then where are where is the list of the trading styles that coordinate with the personality? So how do you measure the personality and what's the list of trading styles? And people repeat this stuff and I just wonder how, why? It doesn't make any sense to me. And you just seemingly to me gave a great example of like, you weren't trying to think whether it fit your personality or not. You just looked at it and said, true, I believe that. Okay, I'm with it. That's an interesting statement. One could argue that I had no idea. I was a clean slate. I mean, I didn't even want to trade. I had no inclination to trade. I didn't know what people were doing. But you make a good point. Why, when I looked at that, all of a sudden it was something I wanted to do where 10 minutes beforehand, I'd never even thought about it. It's not like I had some kind of a want to start trading when I started working at the stockbroking firm. I couldn't give a damn. I was only interested in carrying that briefcase on the train and working in a building. That's all I wanted. But there was some kind of a trigger there. Now, I don't know what that was. Here's another way to think about it. Let's say you leave wherever you're at right now. You walk out into the street. My example is a little graphic. But let's say all of a sudden, three or four people standing next to you clearly just got shot in the head by a sniper. You've not been shot yet. You've got to make a split second judgment. What's going on here? And you need to take action. And in some ways, I'm connecting a crazy example to your moving average crossover, but it's like, okay, you don't know anything. You're a blank slate. You see something. Boom. Okay. I'm adjusting. But why and how? I don't, I'm, I'm not the guy to ask. I just... Does it have something to do with truth? That's what it gets back to the measurement of personality. Here, you're a guy that wants to code. You're a guy that wants to look at math. 
measurement of personality is subjective. There's nothing objective there. Well, especially when you see my maths results from high school and understand I never went to university. Mate, I'm the last guy you'd probably trust to code up a strategy. But My point really here, though, is that I think with your kind of world, my kind of world, measure things, count things, try and figure things out. And again, personality subjective. It's just another story. You know, can you validate the story? If you can't validate the story, then it's just a story. It's a narrative, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think having a clean slate is one thing. But if we get introduced to someone who, let's say they're mid-30s or mid-40s or middle-aged, they have been exposed before to endless Warren Buffett books, like most people are, then perhaps they're not coming from the clean slate. Perhaps they do have some kind of ingrained bias, rightly or wrongly, but they would have that bias. And I think that's probably the difference now. The environment shaped them to a certain way or to some degree shaped their personality and to go backwards becomes very difficult, meaning the environment has actually taken them to a place that they might not have been if they were not, if they were a clean slate. That's my belief. And I get to see that, I guess, and I'm talking broadly with my clients, that a lot of my clients are engineering, they're airline pilots, they're those kind of personalities where they need to know ahead of time. They need to know that there's a structure in place. There's a flight, airline there's a pilot, flight plan. Correct. They need to know that there's backup buttons and backup procedures and whatever else is in place. Same with engineers. You don't go and just dig a hole in some in the ground somewhere and throw some concrete in there. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into what needs to be done for the structural robustness of the building. It's a lovely word, isn't it? Robustness. It's very important. Very important. And it's not a narrative. That's the difference. But maybe, Mike, I attract those people. Maybe that's the difference. Someone who's a staunch fundamentalist ain't going to pick up the phone and give me a call. That's not going to happen. Maybe I'm just exposed, call it selection bias or survivorship bias. I'm not exposed to those that disagree with what I have to say because they don't come across my desk, if you like, unless they're trying to be a smart ass, which happens here and there. But for the most part, a lot of my clients are more technical in nature. They're engineers, they're aircraft pilots, they're programmers, uh, working IT, that kind of stuff. You brought up the turtle mention a few minutes ago. And I'm curious, when you were first exposed to that story, because here we are talking about blank slates, they were a pretty good example of blank slates. And they're a pretty good example of the types of individuals that come to you. They were the same types of individuals that Dennis picked up as well. But when you had that exposure to the turtle back in the day, was there the blank slate thing? Was that kind of hitting you as well too? Like, wow, that's pretty interesting. They they were open to the learning and being in that certain frame or state was a big part of it. It probably wasn't so much thinking about, oh, these guys started with a clean slate like me. That probably wasn't the thinking. It was more confirming what I was already starting to learn that – Every trend starts with a breakout and trend trading is quite possibly one of the easiest ways to create a positive edge. I was just getting confirmation, if you like, of what I was already doing was being done by these guys and being replicated and taught. And that gave me a great deal of confidence to continue to plot along. Absolutely. Big influence on my life. Big influence. Do you have, as we're talking influences, do you have any other influences that you want to mention? people or events that have really shaped you, favorite books, things that have really driven you? I mean, you're a very clear speaker, very grounded. I think people can hear that in your voice. What has shaped you? Oh, it's a good question. I try to make them good here. There's all kinds of preparation that goes into my insanity. It just sits down and turns on the microphone, and then I don't know what happens next. Yeah, you didn't give me any warning on that one. Of course not. No, why, why would I give a warning? There's no no warnings needed, you know? Come on. I don't know if it, whether it's even a, a, a particular individual, a thought, a sentence, a paragraph, a book 
what are the things that have kind of driven you? Or is it just something I find this happening to me these days? There's so many influences. I start to forget what some of them are. I mean, I remember big ones, for example, like a guy like Ed Sakota. I can always think about Ed's famous expression, you know, everybody gets what they want. And that, that one always like sits on the shelf staring at me, right? But I, I don't know if there's any that you would like to share or any that you might recall. A big influence, and I still do this today, my clients or people who have been associated with me over the years will know that I've harped on about this before. Here's one thing I do, and I do it on a regular basis. I go and look at the performance tables of all those guys that you talk about, all of them, David Drews, Dunn, Campbell, Abraham, all of them, Chesapeake. I go back and I look at their monthly performance tables, especially when I'm having a bit of a rough period. By doing that, these guys have been pushing the button every day, every week, every month, every year for decades. And by looking at their performance tables, their monthly performance tables, I can see, well, oof, yeah, well, that crap happened to him as well back then. And look, he's had that losing streak. And look, he's actually had a losing year. It enables me to keep moving forward, knowing that these guys have trodden this path well ahead of me. The same thing happens to them. It's all part and parcel of the journey. And I don't think that's something you really get in other kind of uh, funds management businesses. You usually get a nice equity curve or something, or well, I don't know about a nice equity curve, but you usually get an equity curve and compared to a benchmark, you don't get that month to month split, if you like, of the, the performance tables and that kind of stuff. I still do that today. I've been doing it for years and years and years. And I encourage my clients and students, if you like, to, to just heed what these guys have done ahead of us and understand that, hey, this is the journey that they've traveled and they are considered very, very good traders. It's going to happen to you. Can I offer a negative to this? Because I concur with what you've said. I have put much of this performance data in my books. I remember when I was doing my turtle book, how excited I was when somebody unexpectedly dropped on me for the first time the monthly turtle performance data for while they were in the program, which had never been published. And I thought, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so fascinating. But here's, here's the negative to this. The negative is I wonder if the last 40 to 50 years will be an aberration. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the trend following space, it really got started in the 70s. Some long track records established. But you know, people get old. People go away. I can see that happening. Then what's happening on top of that is instead of there being, which I think will happen in the future, instead of there being like-minded people, perhaps not even connected all around the world with their professional track records for everyone to see and learn from, as you talked about, that maybe we're going to get these huge aggregated funds like AQR and David Harding's firm to where, you know, maybe it becomes harder and harder to see the lesson that you're talking about, which I believe firmly in. And I wonder if there will, if there will end up being, you know, this 50 or 60 year window of performance data. And that will be it because then everything else will get kind of secretive and disguised in the future. It'll be harder and harder to find those like-minded people. Am I completely crazy? Possible. Look at Marty Bergen. He's taken over from Bill Dunn. They're going from strength to strength. So I think what you're saying is a new generation. You're, you're saying potentially, if I'm reading that or listening correctly, that maybe there's going to be a generation drop out or that's going to be it. That was a, a generation. For example, if I look at AQR, they're managing, I don't know, hundreds of billions in assets. David Harding has been at like 30 billion in assets for close to a decade. Many of the great names that we're talking about, even a guy like Bill Dunn probably was never got us maybe like the 2 billion or something like that. And obviously Marty's done a fantastic job, but those new funds are so huge. This is just speculation. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm completely wrong that this learning lesson doesn't go away, that there will continue to be people like Dunn and Marty doing what they're doing. I hope I'm completely wrong. I just, I sometimes wonder if though, 
with these huge, huge, huge funds, things have changed that the fund managers will end up disguising themselves. Let's let's just hope that I'm completely drinking the Kool-Aid today and I will not have truth to my words, but it's worth pondering for people. Look, it is, and I think we're just going to have to let time take that journey and see where it ends up. I, I think, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot going on with regard to technology that will drive us potentially in vastly different directions to where we were back in the 60s and 70s and maybe the early 80s. And that could certainly lead to a very distinct change. Saying that, trends will persist. The strategy won't go away. That I'm not I'm not even attempting to go there. The only way the strategy goes away is if the government rigs the markets to only go sideways. I don't think so. Even if the well, no. I mean <laughs> When I say that performance data might get obscured or we might not be able to see that great data that you're talking about, I'm not by any stretch saying that trend following will go away. I'm just saying that that's a completely different issue. There's no way trend following goes away. People are people. Yep. Well, it'll be interesting to see who's coming up and how they take it on. And I, you know, Well, let's think of momentum. I mean, momentum is essentially trend following. I don't want to get into the debate about diversified commodities and that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, momentum runs on the same skew that trend following does. And if we look at momentum, that's now become one of the biggest academically studied factors of the market over the last 25 years. If we go back into the 80s, nobody was talking about it. That's, I won't say it's the, the new bright world over value, but it's certainly getting a lot more traction than it was even 15 years ago. So that's a good thing. Yeah, well, in the academics, they throw out two forms of momentum, the time series momentum, which is basically trend following, and the cross-sectional, which is kind of a, a relative strength. I always say to people, okay, it sounds great in theory. We can find, as you pointing out with the track records, we can find all the trend following traders, all the time series momentum. We can find that proof. It's a little bit harder, I think, to find sometimes the, the relative strength track records. They don't exist in the same way that the trend following track records exist. I would agree with that. Yet, they may do down the track, but you're quite right. Nick, I can't keep you. I hear the dog, I think. <laughs> yeah, someone must be at the door. He's outside. He wants to He wants to get on this podcast and have a, have a He wants a you off to come play with him. Where can we send people? Where's the best place to find you? The best place to find me is nickradge.com. If they want to drop me an email, nick at nickradge.com. Simple as that. And that'll kind of give you an idea of what I do and, and whatnot. That's the best place, nickradge.com. And if you want to hit me back an email with some of your references, your those influences, the books or whatnot, if you want to hit me back, I will include those in the show notes if you hit me back with those. Since I put you on the spot in the middle of the episode. No, I will say for everyone here, I've told you this before, the complete turtle trader. I don't know if you remember me saying this, but when you released the complete turtle trader, I bought every single copy in Australia. Every single copy. That's not nice. The other people need them too. <laughs> well, you'll have to do a reprint if you haven't already, but I bought every single copy and distributed that book to all my clients. I've never done that before, except for my own book, obviously, but Complete Turtle Trader, there you go. I've told you that before. I still have that same book. It's getting a little faded now in my cupboard here with my minimal trading books, of which I think three out of the 10 are cobble books. <laughs> such a lucky story to be a part of. It's such an amazing story. And sometimes I you just stumble into things in life. And that was a stumble into for me. And wow, you read that thing and you're like, this isn't real. <laughs> This didn't really happen. This is just fake. And then you get behind the scenes and you and you realize, well, you might not, but you should see what I had to leave on the cutting room floor. Let's just say that place was a circus. Not only were they great mathematicians and great traders, but on the personality side, it was a circus. Yeah, I bet. It's uh, pretty amazing. One last thing before we finish up. I think another influence, and still to this day, and I think there is a bit of a takeaway. If you listen to some of these podcasts, the ones that come to mind immediately to me is, you know, the Jerry Parker podcasts. The guy's been around a long time, knows a lot of stuff. He's very laid back. He gives a lot of way between the lines. And I think a lot of people collect little trophies, if you like, whether it be books or podcasts, they 
buy the book or they listen to the podcast and then they put it up on their shelf and say to everyone, hey, I've listened to 487 episodes of this podcast, aren't I good? And I think they miss the point of what's really going on between the lines. And I think Jerry Parker is one of those guys that can really put a nice, strong message, albeit between the lines, that rarely people listen to. And I think that's a significant point to make. I especially make it to my clients. Don't just listen to the podcast for the sake of listening to the podcast. Listen to what the guy is actually saying. And he gives a lot of stuff away. By the way, I should clarify, though, because he might he might kill me when I say circus turtles. I think Jerry was hired as the control. He was the complete non circus, the complete the complete opposite of the circus. And he was the control. hire. So There's nothing about Jerry that's a circus. So he's a pretty laid back guy, doesn't he? <laughs> he's meat and potatoes, CPA mindset. Very smart guy. Great stuff. Hey, Nick, listen, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. We will catch up again in the years to come. And well, I hope you come out to Australia. By the sounds of it, they will be coming over to Saigon before you'll be coming out here. <laughs> well, we'll have to flip a coin and see who moves first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Michael. I really appreciate your time. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up down and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.